Well, welcome everyone once again to the third of our uh, panel discussions around the, the themes and topics raised by uh, Puccini's Bad and Butterfly as we um, perform this piece today. And I, I've just come from the first of our two dress rehearsals, in fact. And I was reminded of, um, I guess it was five years ago when I was in, in America and putting on this piece. And um, we talked in our planning phase about the topic of imperialism and you know, in, which is built into to this work and, and a criticism of imperialism. And my colleagues in America were slightly surprised by this because the, the prevailing view in the States was that basically Pinkerton was, was a bad apple and it didn't really affect anyone else. And so um, they were somewhat surprised when I said, well, no, it's not quite as, you know, as, as easy as that, but actually Pinkerton really is, is an emblem for a critique on the... Um, the exploitation of imperialism of, of the Western powers. So I, th I think it's very timely that this, this third um, discussion uh, takes place. As I say, we, we you know, come to terms with and discuss um, the, the sometimes difficult topics uh, raised by some of our um, core repertoire pieces today. So it's my very good pleasure to um, introduce the, the sort of chair of our, our, our panel this evening, uh, Professor Priya Gopal. Um, Priya is the um, Professor of Post-Colonial Studies uh, in the English Faculty at the University of Cambridge. Um, she tells us her primary interests are in colonial and post-colonial studies, uh, as well as being in the novel, uh, in decolonization, critical race studies, and especially the politics and cultures of empire and globalization. She's been published all over the place in, here in the UK, in The Independent, The Statesman, The Guardian, and of course, as you would expect, has a, a huge range of, of publications as well. So we're really, really um, delighted and honored, to, Priya, to have you um, chairing our panel. And maybe I should hand over to you to introduce um, Robert, Shreya, and Edson, um, and I'll, I'll duck out and I'll, I'll join you all at the end. Priya, over to you. Thank you, Aidan. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Jennifer Hill and the Welsh National Opera for hosting these um, demanding and interesting and necessary discussions. Um, there is a general anxiety and fear around discussing the topic of empire, uh, partly because empire becomes very swiftly the topic of culture wars. And my hope is that in the hour or so that we have today, we will engage with culture and engage with empire, not as war, but as a terrain where all of us have a stake and as a historical uh, phenomenon that is the empire, not just the British empire, but other European empires, as a historical phenomenon that has shaped all of us. I think the discussion today is best seen in terms of thinking about the relationship between culture and empire. And one of the reasons we might want to do that is that the very familiar categories that we now have of the West um, or the East or, or West versus non-West, these are all categories that really only emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries as a consequence of the imperial project. So when we talk about empire, we're also, we're not, it's not an attack on the West, but it really is saying, how did the West constitute itself and how did it constitute itself in relation to its others, the non-West? Um, one question I think that we will talk about is the question of what stories get told about the relationship of West and non-West or the relationship between somebody who thinks of themselves as European and the non-European. And of course, uh, Madame Butterfly is very much about the relationship of um, West to non-West or the West to the East. And this has caused controversy in, in different forms. There is of course a very famous rewriting of Madame Butterfly in the form of David Henry Wong's M butterfly, and the M very much signals also uh, an interest in gender and the role that gender plays in relation to race and empire in this particular um, opera. We are taught very much, I think, um, to think about culture as separate from history or from the grottiness of everyday politics. Um, and I think 
what is good about these discussions is that it sets important and, and influential cultural texts like Madame Butterfly, it takes it out of a protective enclosure and puts it on an important historical and cultural canvas. And here we can remind ourselves that works can be at once brilliant and important and culturally significant, and at the same time deeply caught up in the complexities of politics um, and of history. I, I like to think of culture as a tapestry. Uh, uh, the Pakistani poet Faiz Ahmad Faiz talks about how beautiful brocades have gold and silk on the top, but underneath there might be blood, sweat, and tears. And, and, and if we want to engage with culture fully, then we need to talk about all of it, not, not just the, uh, the beautiful shiny bits. So today we'll think about the question of what is our relationship to the historical experience of empire as people living in 21st century Britain? Um, what does it mean for our engagement with culture? What consequences did empire have for the imagination? All the great operas uh, that we uh, see staged today all emerged really in the 19th century and they emerged not just uh, Butterfly but others emerged in the heyday of the European imperial project and it is worth recalling that by 1914 that is the outbreak of the first world war 85% uh, 85% of earth was in some form or the other annexed to the imperial cultural project. So there's really nobody, no culture, no person untouched by that project. We will also assume, I think, that uh, culture cannot be untouched by empire and that actually uh, imperialism, colonialism are not just uh, projects of accumulation and militarism, but they are also um, as it were, ideological and cultural projects. They need uh, culture to uh, uh, consolidate them. Um, I'm just going to read out two quotations before I introduce the panelists. The first is from the great uh, writer and theorist and academic Edward Said. And he says, neither imperialism nor colonialism is a simple act of accumulation and acquisition. Both are supported and perhaps even impelled by impressive ideological formations that include notions that certain territories and people require and beseech domination. This is, of course, the peg on which uh, David Henry Wong tied his interpretation of uh, M. Butterfly. And I, I'm going to quote uh, from him here. He says, for the myths of the East, the myths of the West, the myths of men than the myths of women, these have so saturated our consciousness that truthful contact between nations and lovers can only be the result of heroic effort. I hope that in today's discussion, we will be able to put some effort into trying to, un to un open up a more truthful contact with history and between um, ourselves. Uh, let me now introduce our um, amazing uh, and talented panelists. Uh, Shreya Handley is, sorry, Shreya Sen Handley is a print and television journalist. She is the author of the award-winning Memoirs of My Body, the short story collection Strange, and the travelogue Handle with Care. A columnist and a creative writing teacher and an illustrator, Shreya's poetry has spearheaded a British national campaign against hate crimes. And her pandemic play, Quiet, premiered in London this year. Shreya is also a Welsh national opera librettist and their opera Migrations goes on tour in the UK next year. Dr. Robert Fawkins is a South African composer based in the UK. His music is performed and broadcast internationally, and he has been uh, and his and his work has been recorded on several labels, including Naxos, Herald, Orchid, Metier, and Nimbus. He writes chamber, orchestral, and vocal music, and most recently, his opera Bekizizwe was premiered on the BBC Wales uh, Festival of Voice, 2021, and his duo Peer Music was performed at the Penarth 
Chamber Music Festival. He was elected an associate of the Royal Academy of Music in 2014 for making a significant contribution to the music profession. He is also senior lecturer in composition and directs the contemporary music group at Cardiff University. Uh, our third speaker, Dr. Edson Burton, is a writer, historian, program curator, and performer. His academic and creative interests are inspired by the Atlantic slave trade, representation, and post-war race relations. He is the author of poetry collection Seasoned, the R4 trilogy Deacon, and among his stage credits uh, are a contributing libretto to the Welsh National Opera's forthcoming uh, production, Migrations. He also writes uh, radio drama such as The Chosen One and Deacon, and he's also a curator of uh, cinematic and history projects. Welcome to all three of you. I'm gonna kick off um, with Edson first. Edson, how do we read uh, Madame Ma Butterfly in relation to empire and colonialism? How do you read it? So it's a complex play because in some ways it expands our conversation around empire. And for people who have joined us today, they might wonder is what's the story of Japan and empire if in a sense it's about American influence. But colonialism, I think is, is broader as a project and in terms of its penetration broader than actual economic or colonialism in terms of bodies on the ground. Um, it is also then, it's to think of that particular time as something which I think is almost, sort of almost prophetic in terms of the now, that at that particular point in which Puccini uh, wrote the, the opera, uh, we're looking at a time of the ascendance of the US in the Pacific region. We're also looking at the Japan's, this is coming to nationhood as a regional power, but at the same time also wanting to be seen as part of a, of, a, of a modernizing project. And it's the participation of American cultural imperialism within that. And it's that I think, which is particularly relevant for us today. And also, so yes, there are so many questions that Madame Butterfly answers and raises, which can be extended to uh, our discussion of empire. But also I think in particular, looking at our post-colonial times, for me, the resonance is, in particular around this idea of modernity as being based upon Western civilizations, upon Western notions, which have now become interrogated and challenged because of course, one of the problems, one of the things for empire was this presumption that the metropolis would somehow be remain intact, impure and uncontested. And so the minute in a sense that contestation occurs because people who were formerly the silent subjects have voice, have agency, and, and within through globalization become economic power, have economic powers too, then that ability to hold that sense of who that ability to kind of represent and speak for and exoticize an other becomes so much more problematic. So Madame Butterfly in its in the trajectory of the opera itself is a story of how we have moved and shifted over time. It's in a sense what has now become problem, what was once accepted has now become problematic because of course the empire writes back to borrow from Paul Gilroy. But it also tells us very much about where we are now and the, the signification um, of how this current adaption, what that tells us in fact around um, the impossibility of returning to a way of talking about Madame, of depicting Madame Butterfly as it was done in Puccini's first, uh, first um, depiction representations. That it is impossible to think of others and create others and exoticize when in fact we are present, we are now part of Britain, we have voice. And not only that, but what it is to be British itself. And this is a, it's not a culture war, um, to, which is the language of being thrown out, more like an, an identity transformation. And it's in a, and that identity transformation has, I think, very much come about because of the conversations that have happened through not just the decline of empire, but in the way in which the metropolis has been transformed by people who were once seen as the silent subjects of empire. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one interesting point I was thinking about is that uh, the opera, I think, comes out in 1904. 
Um, and 1905, of course, is an electrifying uh, moment across the empire because Japan defeats Russia. And it, it electrifies anti-colonial movements across the world. So it is interesting to me that the opera is written really in a period where, as you say, Japan is coming is on the one hand, it is the target of US imperialism, party to a very unequal trade uh, relationship, party to militarization and the American military presence, which is what, of course, the opera uh, takes as its context. But equally, there are res resistant voices. Um, I'm going to ask Rob now. Rob, how do you read uh, the opera in relation to empire? Do you think it anti-imperialist? Do you think it has its anti-imperial moments, potential? Um, I, th I think, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've actually just come from the dress rehearsal myself, um, which I think, you know, my big thing uh, in life and in my teaching and my, in my work is um, you know, I'm very interested. Yeah, I believe in kindness being very important. And I find um, I find watching Madame Butterfly again after quite a quite a few years. It's a while since I last saw production, probably in Cape Town, actually, in the Cape Town Opera. The last time I saw this, that is, that is a while ago. Um, this is the sheer sort of unthinking brutality of it, actually. Um, the the kind of quite, quite, quite sort of uh, laissez-faire kind of approach to the way um, you know, Pinkerton just sort of walks in and goes, oh, yeah, I could do this, um, does it, and walks off and goes, oh, well. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, I mentioned to you the other day, Priya, this, this sort of thing I've been thinking about a little bit, and essentially this is kind of paraphrasing what, what uh, all kind of... Um, rewording what Edson was just talking about there that the piece seems to me in some ways quite a quite a strong metaphor um for the colonial project um in the sense that you know these countries sort of essentially kind of turned up um as essentially free agents who were able to act um as they wished uh, in spaces uh, whether whether they imposed themselves or were invited in um as was often the case um by you know you know none of these places that they landed at were single singular entities where there was only a, a single cultural group acting that could uh, resist or not you know there were multiple entities and there were often people welcoming um of the uh, of the imp imperial um forces that were landing there were others that are um, um, objecting but i guess in in butterfly the important thing of course is that she very willingly accepts um his uh, his proposal and, and and quite unwittingly without understanding the sort of sheer kind of disinterested kind of playful engagement with which he is approaching the whole thing um, i'm not suggesting that uh, empire was playful at all but it is the ability to kind of insert yourself into a situation without considering the consequences of the uh, of the people and the culture that you're acting on. And I think that's essentially, you know, at the end where Pinkerton sort of goes, oh, I'm such a bad person, this is really terrible. Um, it, it's a bit late, really. And, and in a way, he sort of, what I think is quite remarkable in, in relation to what Edison was saying as well, and something um, I'm very interested in, is that at the end of all of this kind of, uh, like I said, this sort of big metaphor of uh, him turning up, acting as he seems, leaving her behind, but he walks away with what is valuable, which is the child. Um, and I think actually for me that's really quite striking and this this idea of kind of coming back and the way empire and colonies have massively enriched and and changed um, the empire itself uh, what was the empire obviously um, I think is is really quite striking so I think um, yes I, I to be really honest I found it uh, watching Madame Butterfly again um, after such a long time I found it quite quite distressing to be honest and not for the, the sort of sheer kind of extraordinary glory of of Puccini's ability to kind of draw you into the situation and, and sort of smack you in the face when he um, when he wants you to feel something. He's very good at that, and uh, you know I absolutely adore Puccini. But um, the sort of underlying brutality of it is is uh, and the sort of unthinking and like I say, almost carefree brutality of it, and consequence free brutality of it, is what really struck me um, about the piece this evening, and really kind of again sort of made me can really consider this this idea of the colonial project so i don't know if that answers your question and like i said very much paraphrasing what edson was saying i think but um mm. that was my thought today i'm feeling i'm feeling quite upset about it all to be honest uh, watching watching <laughs> madam watching the dress rehearsal really was quite hard hitting in, in ways i hadn't expected to be honest okay thank you we'll come back to the question of how we relate to texts that that are you know in a sense enact a certain brutality and enact um, a, 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 a discomfort, particularly, um, you know, at this historical remove. Um, Shreya, uh, I wondered if you had similar thoughts on the question of empire and narrating empire and telling the story 
uh, of empire? Uh, how, how does that work for you? Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of Madam Butterfly, I agree with Rob and Edson. It is about colonization. It is about annexation. But what struck me was, and, and that also relates to narrating empire, is that it's so much about illusions and delusions. It's about the delusions of grandeur that attended empire, the delusions of the assumed, the assumptions of superiority and subservience on the part of, of the colonized, of the oppressed. That's very much there in Madame Butterfly. I mean, Pinkerton and Chocho San are, are kind of embodiment. Uh, they are the embodiment of those two uh, positions. They're both deluded in different ways. They're, they're illusions, uh, I would say, Madame Butterfly herself, those are illusions of faith. You know, she has faith in Pinkerton and his are delusions of grandeur and superiority and, and her subservience. And what made me really uncomfortable was the realization that it exists now. You know, we, it's so much a part of our lives still. And, the, and it's interesting that we've called our chat the long arm of imperialism mm -hmm. because that long arm not only reaches us today but it reaches our children in schools, in British schools, particularly the one I know best over the last few years, the ones I know best as a parent, as, as a school governor, as, as a teacher sometimes, because we don't have, and, and this is the thing we were talking about rewriting narrative. The narrative hasn't been rewritten at all over the years. British schools are still teaching the same deluded, deliberately deleted stories of, of grandeur and glory and of empire being this force for good, when it at all touches upon it. Most of the time it's whitewashed, it's swept away. Our children learn nothing, nothing of empire, nothing about the realities of it, uh, just fantasies. And that, that to me is the real connection with Madame Butterfly, that those are fantasies, Pinkerton's fantasies of the East being, uh, you know, she, a plaything, a, a thing to play with, uh, something uh, erotic and beautiful and romantic, and the kind of stories that our children still get in British schools are the same, romantic, mysterious. The East is a, a primitive thing that had to be civilized, if at all it is mentioned. So yeah, so to me, it, it made me, watching Madame Butterfly made me realize how much of it is still prevalent how mm -hmm. much we still, you know, we, we live with those delusions. We've done nothing to disabuse our children of them, uh, you know, in schools. And because they're the very bedrock of future generations, if we carry on with this curriculum, if we change nothing about what we're teaching them, um, we continue to have this very deluded society. I have a question that I'll uh, ask you to address and also perhaps Edson following on from you. I mean, how would changing how we narrate empire how does how does that help us in the present so yes you you know you said there are these delusions and nothing's changed yeah. how should we change our engagement with empire and why well did you want me to talk first yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and then, and yeah, then maybe yeah, 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 sure. okay so yeah. surely that's just about telling other stories it's about bringing in different perspectives it's about opening up to, there is a real resistance, especially in schools, especially in, in institutions, educational institutions, where I think it really, really matters. We get to tell our stories. We get to tell our stories to adults sometimes, you know, audiences. Uh, we're writing migrations, Edson and I, and, and a couple of other writers together, all brilliant. And we're, it's wonderful that we're getting to tell these stories. We write our books, some people read it, we write our columns, fabulous. But we're not telling those stories to the people who are going to shape the future, our children. And to me, uh, and, and, and yes, and how do we do that? Important question, interesting question. Clearly it's about telling other stories and clearly it's not just about bringing in mothers for uh, you know, uh, religious education once in a year to talk about different religions. So I went in to talk to my children's classes about other perspectives, other religions, other histories. And then I got back letters, just, you know, nothing, the kids were brilliant, but I got back letters thanking me talk, for talking about mosques, 
uh, as it happened, I hadn't talked about mosques, but another lady had gone in and talked about mosques. But this is the thing, it happens so rarely, and we're seen as so much of one mosque. We, to them, we have one single story to tell, mm -hmm. simply because they are used to that one single story. The fact that there are many different voices, many different interpretations, many different perspectives is not something that we teach our children about or to, to know how to handle. And going into the world without that appreciation of differences and diversity and how to cope with it is what's creating the problems that we see in society now, the rise in hate crimes. Amazingly, a huge rise over the last few years and so on. So. Thank you. Edson, I mean, uh, would yeah. you say that it is mainly a case of proliferating stories, uh, producing different narratives, um, increasing the number of perspectives, or um, is, is there more challenging work inside there? I think in a sense that the stories and the proliferation of change is, is part of a wider interrogation, perhaps, and it's perhaps it's sort of dealing with the disease. I mean, I, I, British identity, I think, has been coupled with empire in such a way that I, I think we're missing, or to pose it this way, can Britain be great without empire? Would we still have Britain? Will we still have British greatness? And, you know, I, I think of the liberal tradition, the chartists, the, the, the change of, in terms of British history, what it's brought around, um, the contestation between classes um, that have, in a sense, made this country dynamic and also made some of its discourses and so on that it is pushed out into the world so magnetic uh, and why others have been attracted to it. But we've become wedded to this notion of empire, so wedded to it that I, I think the, the problem is that we cannot, we need to move beyond it in order to make sense of Britain today and the plurality of voices, but also to kind of come to a new understanding of where Britain is in the world. And also, and this is perhaps a slightly utopian project, but to actually pull, to look at the essence of some of those things that could make a country great, which are not about colonial violence. And it is about plurality. It is about, in a sense, having a dynamic mix. It is about, in a sense, the security, the relative security, although of course there are forces against that, of its institutions that mean, in a sense, that other parts of the world admire Britain. But at, what we're stuck with is saddled with is this notion of greatness that has a, that was in a sense, I think very much tied to how to ruling uh, a class of people who uh, are suspending, I think, class antagonisms in Britain by this imperial notion of our place in the world. But what it means also, I think, for us uh, and for, and it's interesting that Robert, you mentioned the, the child in the play. And I, I see us all as, in a sense, the children of empire, but perhaps in a problematic, confused and and troubled way um, because our, our birth has been traumatic and our, one of our parents has been remiss, if not callous. But it, in a sense, if we, th this conversation for us as sitting within this, this position now, this place, uh, which we cannot escape, we are in the post-colonial moment, I'm a product of it. But if we are to make sense and navigate what that transformation meant without running towards sort of atavistic ideas or of a pre-colonial time, which is sort of trouble free and that we need to return to. If we are to make sense of our place now and what were the, what are the things, what is the conversation that we can have with Western knowledge and civilization that's in a sense outside of the, the opposition that has come about through the brutality of, of colonialism. And that I think could be, if we can resolve this thing of what is this national identity crisis, not run away from it with a diverted culture war, nor also seek refuge in imagined pasts as a sort of anti-imperialistic notion, then I, I think that we have the possibility of pushing the human project on further. 
Certainly, I think the idea uh, that Edward Said put out of us having overlapping and intertwined histories um, and that the history of empire and the history of the post-colonial world are tied up and, and thinking about empire is not a project you know, for one sort of people. It's something that all of us have to be involved in. It's a project of self-scrutiny, uh, no matter what your historical position. Um, with that in mind, uh, Rob, I wanted to ask you, um, should we be returning to texts like Madame Butterfly? Um, or should the brutality, the sense of uh, the cringe that you, you know, in a sense, touched on, um, does that mean they should be retired? Can they be recovered? Can they be, you know, what goes into a restaging? Um, uh, you know, are these classics for a reason? Um, what possibilities are opened up by restaging? Well, I, th I think, I mean, what, it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I mean, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of Puccini. Um, you know, my, I'm a composer, obviously, and, you know, my answer is let's write new operas that tell new stories and uh, let's not be scared of them. Let, let's enjoy exploring all the stories that come into the, the, the world that we, uh, this world, this moment where we are now, and rather, as Edson, was, Ed, as Edson was saying, rather than kind of looking back to imagine the past, wherever they may be, sort of going, this is where we are now. We are all part of this post-colonial world you know this this is just where we are and that goes for everybody in this zoom and indeed i think pretty much everyone in the world um and like i said my answer to that is make new work that actually explores that moment um but of course um i'm also my, my background's in classical music uh, one of my first uh, jobs as a, as a musician was singing kept on opera um as a baritone when i was 18 i was very fortunate to be asked to go and sing along and join there and i'm i'm very so I'm very conscious of what the world of opera uh, really entails, which is there are these beautiful, wonderful, extraordinary pieces that people want to hear. Um, and I think the big difficulty with this, and, and in a way what I found striking about watching the show this afternoon, um, was that a piece that you can kind of skate over all of this and just kind of go for, you know, Chao Chao San's personal tragedy, uh, which is kind of how the piece has often been, been dealt with. And... But if you do, if you take a production, if you sort of rethink it and kind of really foreground these issues, it is actually quite an uncomfortable watch. And I think this this really is. Uh, so the question then is for the average opera goer, um, and if there is such a thing, of course, I, I suspect there isn't. But for the for the people who go to opera because they want to hear Madame Butterfly, um, Fidelio, you know, all the big Verdi operas, all the big Puccini, all the Mozarts, you know, utterly glorious music, um, you know, does this then take these pieces outside the realm of what they want to be engaging with? Um, and I, I, that, that's a very difficult question. And I think it's, it's a structural question as much as anything else, because, of course, you know, opera is, as we all know, a massively expensive art form. Um, and if we don't have an audience, uh, we don't have an art form. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where I think we have to we have to explore um, as companies do all the time new productions that explore what these pieces are about how how and, and explore how to deal with them maybe foreground these things and see i suppose whether people are still keen to watch them and i think for the music we you know like i say i'll I'm quite happily listen to puccini any day of the week despite you know obviously the sort of brutality against women isn't just a thing in in mother butterfly it's a big thing in turandot um it's a big thing in la bohem etc etc you know it's a real sort of theme of his work so do we retire all of those pieces because of this kind of underlying uh, apparent um misogyny is it misogyny you know um or do we acknowledge that address it, present productions that are honest about that and and sort of uh, and and present that to the audience and ask the question um which i guess is a, is probably in some ways as useful as um as any other approach um i think if we i mean again as a, as a contemporary composer i'm deeply conscious of the fact that if you just present new work um you know the audience goes well i'm here to see madame butterfly i don't want to watch a new piece about you know whatever it might be um by any given composer so, so I so I suppose the answer is a sort of a it's a complete fudge as most things are in life. I think these if we can present these pieces honestly and exploring the things that underlie them and say, well, do we still want to watch these things and ask the audience the question because they'll answer us, won't they? Um, by being there or not, I suppose. I mean, one of the difficulties, of course, is that the nub of the story, in one sense, its beauty and its romance 
relies on the gender difference and the racial difference, right? There is, uh, I'm, I'm gonna read you a little, little extract from M. Butterfly, where the opera singer is talking to her, her, his would be lover. And she says, consider it this way. What would you say if a blonde homecoming queen fell in love with a short Japanese businessman? He treats her cruelly, then goes home for three years, during which time she prays to his picture and turns down marriage from a young Kennedy. Then when she learns he has remarried, she kills herself. Now, I believe you should consider this girl to be deranged, correct? But because it's an Oriental who kills herself for a Westerner, you find it beautiful. Um, Part of what he's getting at there, the, the playwright, is that that particular structural difference, which is gendered and racialized, is quite fundamental to the story of Madame Butterfly. So how much can you rewrite it without making it something else entirely? And, and I'm addressing the, the person you uh, evoked, Rob, uh, the person who just wants to go and watch Puccini untouched uh, and un unfiddled uh, with, in a sense. Um, I'm going to bring in Shreya here. Shreya, uh, gender. How does yes. gender tie into the question of empire and race? Gosh, I mean, gender is such a large part of what was wrong with empire in a way. Uh, to me, I mean, Madame Butterfly is about exploitation. Colonizing cultures are all about exploitation. Everybody gets exploited, but somehow the woman gets exploited even more. Uh, so because there's a sort of racist hierarchy, there's a race hierarchy, or rather, no, racist hierarchy, let me put it that way, whereby the woman, it, there's, she has a double whammy of race and gender to contend with, and she gets discriminated against and abused and, and exploited from all sides. There's a sort of kicking downwards. So, and, and I think you see that in Madame Butterfly, where she seems to be exploited by all comers. Uh, Suzuki seems to be the only nice person in it all. That might be quite a simplistic read of it. But yeah, um, so for, for women and why, why this particular, this exploitation, this abuse is still so relevant, unfortunately, and why it is important to put Mad Madame Butterfly on again in a new form is because go back two weeks and it's happening again. I mean, it's never stopped, but Afghanistan, for example. So when the imperialist powers that have created the situation in Afghanistan decide to leave overnight and leave the Afghan women to the Taliban, the mercies of the Taliban, uh, a misogynistically, horribly misogynistic power, uh, it's, it reminded me that the, the, it resonated with me to such a degree because I've been, I was, we've been talking about Madame Butterfly at the same time. It's about abuse and use and abandonment. And in that colonial structure, that's what happens to the women of that, uh, of, of amongst the oppressed. They, they just get doubly oppressed, they're doubly exploited. And so it is about, it, I think, for me, it was, it's about colonialism, but it's so much more, even more so about gender. It's about how gender gets treated in, when these two, these two forces collide and what happens to women when East and West meet, collide, fall out, and the ones holding the baby literally, and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, in that, in that terrible situation of not, it's, it's never a win-win. There's, there's no way for them to win. It's the women. Can I, can I just um, yeah, add yeah, to, uh, I, and also I think that Madame Butterfly, what I saw was parallels to uh, European classes in West Africa and also in, in, the, in the Americas during slavery. This element, the, the reality to which colonial service or resettlement allowed men in particular, white men to play out kinds of behavior which were not acceptable. They were able to, be transgressive uh, abroad and to indulge fantasies or, or ways of being that would be incredibly problematic in, in the metropole, which is why I think Pickerton was such a, an important and powerful example. But at the same time, just also to add, sure, I think one of the discussions, I've been reading a couple of essays on Madame Butterfly, it's interesting, the, 
the ways in which nations depict themselves as male, um, masculinist ideas of, of the nation state and the nation identity. So that in the end, just as you mentioned, Shreya, Afghanistan, what we then see is again, the pushback around women as the context of the space, both between the West in terms of it, it, how it purports a certain kind of liberal emphasis and, and concern, but also by conservative forces that wish to control women. And, but it's also, I think this is a global problem now with the incel movement as well. It's, there's something perennial uh, that Madam Butterfly is telling us about exploitation, exploitation um, but also something which is particularly specific too, to its time and the way in which white men were able to behave and act and play out um, across, the, across the empire and also in areas in which they were settled communities. Um, they, it was a field day, it was a holiday, it was party time. Um, thank you, Rob. I wanted to ask you, I mean, we've been talking about restagings and revisions of uh, operas like uh, Madame Butterfly in the Metropole and the stories, as you were saying, Edson, about different identities within the Metropole, the pluralization of the Metropole. What happens when Madame Butterfly goes to, say, South Africa? Um, what happens in that context and, and what stories might need to be told there? I mean, it's it's fascinating, you know. Of course, uh, for a long time uh, under apartheid, you know, the the big opera companies were all um, set up under apartheid and funded by apartheid. So it was really for white people, um, obviously. Uh, although there were other th groups in Cape Town, for example, there was the Eon Group, which was um, uh, which was a mixed race uh, group of opera singers who decided they wanted to sing opera, so they put on opera and they they made a venue for themselves. But if you were if you wanted to get state support. To sing opera, you had to do it um, at what used to be uh, the the opera house in Cape, well, the opera house in Cape Town, where KPAB and various other organisations were. So, um, and of course, part of that was about the you know the about the Afrikaans nationalist um, state trying to prove their credentials as a civilized uh, European nation, essentially. Um, and so there, there wasn't a lot of questioning going on at that stage. So that, that sort of goes up to about 19, well, sort of the early 90s. Um, in uh, 1994, um, like I said before, I was, I was 18 in 1994, I sort of feel slightly midnight children about that, which is quite nice, um, where the, <laughs> Where I was singing in the opera a company, um, just through dint of uh, personal connections, as happens, I was very privileged, I was very lucky to have that. I was also asked to support the first group, so this is 1994, the first group of black singers who were brought into Cape Town Opera um, as a sort of a train, they were called the Choral Training Programme. Um, and because I had some vague keyboard skills, I was asked to just kind of support that group. But that was in 1994, the very first group of black mm -hmm. singers were brought into Cape Town Opera um, to, to sort of form a, the, the core of what is now actually um, the Cape Town Opera Chorus, which is actually, um, I think, pretty much exclusively black or mixed race. Um, so I think in terms of the question, the stories that are told now, I mean, we still have, you know, over the last 20 odd years, um, Captain Opera has done various uh, pretty standard productions. They have made a big name for themselves internationally doing Porgy and Bess, because uh, they're one of the few companies in the world um, that is able to uh, essentially put on an entire cast uh, that is black as required, uh, apart from two small roles, um, uh, as is required by the Gershwin Estate. You know, it is one of the only companies that, um, that can do that very easily. And so they've actually toured the world with that. They've also made a few new pieces. Uh, they did the Big Mandela trilogy, which actually performed was performed at um, the Millennium Center and around the UK a few years ago, um, which is a new piece, sort of composite piece by various composed, South African composers. So that sort of thing does happen, um, but you still get, you know, sort of standard rep being performed in standard ways. Um, with essentially colorblind casting, um, just sort of saying, well, you know, if you need to be Maria Stuada, whether you're black, white, mixed race, whatever it is, you can be Maria Stuada, it's fine. Um, so there's that sort of thing. And then, of course, there's also an entire universe um, of uh, the, the choral tradition in South Africa, the, the black choral tradition, which kind, which sort of grows to some degree out of um, 
uh, I guess, sort of a, a combination of traditional um, African, uh, South African musics and uh, sort of basically Methodist hymn, hymnody and that sort of thing. Um, so there's this very big choral movement, um, which has become very, very engaged with opera. Um, and so the people who kind of come through the choral movement will often now go on and study um, opera at Cape Town uh, Opera School at the university there where I studied um, or in Johannesburg or in, uh, in Durban. Um, so there's um, there's a very large group of uh, young singers and sort of well young to middle aged singers who are exceptional. Um, you'll some of those of you who are uh, into opera will know people like Pretty Yende or Njugula Madlala who uh, um, who are kind of making really big names for themselves internationally. But they are singing standard opera roles. Most of them, uh, you know, the, the guys who are making their names uh, at the Met or wherever else, they are singing just the big roles. Um, Whereas in South Africa, you're starting to see now um, that out of this tradition of choral singing, which has become, which has sort of become uh, moved into this the world of opera, it's a very big thing now. Um, you find that there are composers, and there have been for some time now, who are starting to write operas, telling stories from a South African perspective. Often, uh, for example, there's a number of people have written things about, for example, the famous Zulu king Shaka. Um, you know, there's some big pieces about him, or you know, things like that. So telling quite um, sort of important stories from South Africa. Those things haven't found an international market yet, but I, I suspect they will soon. I mean, there's some really remarkable things going on. Um, sorry, that's a very quick and, and uh, potted history, but I, I hope that gives some sense of... Yeah, of... yeah, thank you. I mean, as a literary critic, of course, uh, for me, I was thinking about uh, the question of empire and what happens when you think about empire in, in historicized ways. And in a way, it's easier with literature. So I think back to the controversy around Mansfield Park and slavery, um, or really any, any Dickens and, and slavery, and the fact that we actually know uh, that Dickens was deeply, uh, in a sense, racialist, uh, deeply hostile uh, to the, the colonized and, and the enslaved. Um, and we can know that and take and nonetheless continue to read his work enriched by that knowledge in one sense, right? That we can see how Dickens's imagination was actually shaped, even when he's not explicitly talking about empire or race, is actually shaped by empire and race. Um, and in a way it's easier with literature because it's sitting there and you can go back to it and you can reread texts. Do you think that that's an option available to the great 19th century opera and ballet classics, which are, you know, again, steeped in, uh, you know, in empire at its height? Um, can they be rescued through history? Does, does opera give us that option? Um, so, so or I mean, do we have to do something entirely different? So, I mean, my, my, you know, again, uh, certain things I haven't spoken about. I mean, for example, uh, there is a company that, uh, that won the... Um, I can't remember what what incarnation they were in at the time, but they won the Berlin Film Festival um, for their U Carmen Kailicha um, a few years ago, which was basically they took Carmen and they sort of filleted it and turned it into a film set in Kailicha, just outside one of the big townships, just outside Cape Town. Um, a remarkable piece of work. Uh, the same company made um, various pieces. One called uh, Yimi Mangaliso, the mysteries, which sort of took South African, it uh, took Bible stories and sort of set them in a very sort of multicultural South African way. They also did um, Beggar's Opera. Um, and uh, the magic flute, uh, you know, various things like that. And they simply reinvented the pieces. I mean, a similar way, I guess, to the way um, W. No did the Don Pasquale a few years ago, um, which simply t takes the piece, takes the, takes the thing as it is, and kind of goes, what can we do with this that makes it into a new piece that tells, tells the story in a very different way, in, a very, in, in the Don Pasquale example, in a very modern way, in the example of uh, the company I was talking about in South Africa, in a very sort of African way or sort of, a, but in a contemporary African way, rather than trying to kind of go back and look at what the past was and that sort of thing. Okay. So can that, I ask, oh, sorry, powerful. go ahead. Sorry, no, go I, ahead. I think that's a very powerful, powerful approach that, that has been taken and done very effectively, both in South Africa and I think around the world. Thank you. Um, Shreya Etson, would you want to comment on this question of our relationship to the classics and the way forward? Uh, you know, do we keep them? Do we revise them? Or do we do entirely new things? What, what are your <laughs> thoughts on this? Well, I've spent whole evenings debating about cancel culture, which is basically what a part of an element of this. Um, and, and my feeling is that we can't really cancel everything we disagree with. There would be a lot from, you know, if we go around asking each of us individually, there's so much we don't agree with, quite rightly often, 
but they have to remain. They have to remain to remind us of the things that we do need to look at again, the things we do need to move away from. So reinterpretation, new stories are fabulous and hugely important, but reinterpretation is important too. I believe with Madam Butterfly itself, Japan at one time, uh, they, they decided to sort of own Madam Butterfly despite their disagreements with it. They actually staged it themselves with many important differences. Uh, it was just some interesting history I was reading another day. And uh, they kind of made it their own and they put forward their own interpretation. What's important about reinterpretations is that you're taking something that's well entrenched in our imagination, in, in sort of global culture, and it's been seen one way, and then you just move it around a little bit, turn its face to the light ever so slightly, and that little turn will quite possibly have a far bigger impact than trying to introduce somebody to a whole new uh, body of work or, or a whole new story altogether. So okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're in a, a precarious time in some ways, because I, 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 I think there is a out of risk aversion and, and a fear of offence that there is a perhaps, a, and certainly I've encountered it, an impulse towards not looking at certain plays or operas again and sort of shelving them. And I've even come across performances in which uh, actors of colour have missed out on roles because the thing has been so reinterpreted. In terms of being interested in the ecology of performance and opportunities for performers, it's a shame that there wasn't more creative ways of thinking through those kind of theatrical opportunities that uh, could have arisen. Um, but I, I think there is, there is something in uh, Madame Butterfly, like in Macbeth, for example, which writers uh, from the so-called former empire have been interested in and enthused by. Um, there is something about, I think, perhaps the, the quality of the writing or the quintessential storytelling. And also because you know that for an audience, as Shrey was saying, there is an entry point and route. So in a sense, a bit like hip hop, quite often these tools or fragments of empire that created elsewhere, these products are then subverted, and rearranged and, and thrown back. It, perhaps the, the, the most striking thing in a sense, and that's what Puccini didn't envisage, and what a great many of these masters didn't envisage, is that these pieces no longer belong to them, that they belong to us, and we're going to dissect and recreate and play with them as we see fit. There are, in a sense, I guess the question is to ask is, what is it about a tale that endures, and what is it about the original telling that endures? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think perhaps these are the questions which open the doors as to what would be the reinterpretation or what might be a reason for playing it straight. There are elements of Madame Butterfly. Uh, there, there was a lot of cultural detail which was insensitively wrong, but you know, if people do their work well, then it opens the door to what is this story about? And this interpretation we're looking at is actually about sexual exploitation uh, and it's current and relevant now. So we would, we would lose a, a powerful myth around the essence of the story if we were to, in a sense, shy away from it and see it as sort of completely and forever tarnished. As opposed I mean, the other to interesting thing, before. of course, is that texts yield things um, in a way despite themselves. So when, when we read historically, when you read Madame Butterfly historically, you are reminded, for instance, uh, reading his history alongside the text, that the period leading up to 1907 was a period of Japanese migration to the US and great anti-migration sentiment and, and xenophobia. Um, and that's something that in a sense the text gives our present because it is something in history that has returned to our, or has never left and is very salient in our current consciousness. Um, and it, it opens up all kinds um, of, of possibilities. I mean, even if one doesn't see Madame Butterfly as anti-imperialist precisely, it certainly has tensions which rewritings can pull out 
um, and work with. Um, I realize now that I forgot to, to tell uh, attendees that if they have questions, they should put them uh, in the Q&A. Um, and while we wait, we do have a couple of minutes for Q&A. I just uh, wondered if there were closing thoughts uh, from, from you all uh, very quickly. Shreya, do you, do you have closing thoughts on the topic? Yeah, I just feel that it's, it's important to discuss in imperialism, especially now. It would seem a very old fashioned thing to be dwelling on, but it's not, it's very real, it's very relevant. Um, bullying has gone up, racist hate crimes have gone up ever since Brexit perhaps, or perhaps ever since that mood of, the country, of our country, of, of society changed towards, you know, towards that kind of going back to an insular past. Uh, even as society, one section of society moves towards that, there is a real need for other sections to be discussing it, to be dissecting it, to be, to be looking into how we can actually prevent that because we have made great gains. Multicultural voices can be heard. We're talking tonight um, and, and that just needs to keep up, keep on and, and for the children especially. Thank you, thank you, Shreya. Edson? I, I think one of the, it's very difficult to make sense of modern multicultural Britain and how this has occurred if one doesn't understand colonialism and Britain's role around the world. And the, the British government, successive British governments have done an incredibly poor job of, in a sense, informing the public as to what its role was abroad. So that by the, the 50s and 60s with mass uh, new Commonwealth migration, you have a white populace that are in a sense in the dark as to what's happening. So, but it also, so we have that in terms of understanding our identity and our role and how um, this country has been transformed. But I also, I think, again, I, I think our media, whether it's theater or film, continues to export a, a colonial fantasy, a mythology of the West that is incredibly seductive and remains seductive and it's transforming the world and for which people are dying um, because they are trying to reach this ideal either physically or in the imagination. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a responsibility for truth telling and for in a sense escaping the delusion, which is what Chocho San in some ways is a victim of the, the illusion of the imperialist exportation of an idea. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, and last but not least, Rob. Um, yes, I mean, I think, you know, so much of the concern about these sorts of conversations is, is really driven by fear, I guess. Um, and I think I would just completely agree with, with Edson that, you know, so much of this is just about education. And if you understand where people are coming from and why they might sort of see the world in a way that you don't see it, you know, you can always... If, if we educate people to understand these 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 historical uh, threads that have led us to this point, um, then this conversation isn't something we need to be afraid of. It's something we have to have because we are all here. You know, we are all in this place. So we need to have this conversation. And if we can approach that from a point of understanding, I think the fear becomes uh, much reduced um, rather than it being about people attacking your culture. It becomes about you saying, well, I'm part of your culture. Your, your culture and my culture are actually the same thing on a certain level. And what I bring to it might be slightly different. What you bring to it might be slightly different. But we are all here coexisting. And uh, as uh, I think Ed said, Edson said very beautifully earlier about sort of, you know, this is a big humanist project, you know, of, uh, from my perspective, you know, this this could this could and should be a beautiful, wonderful thing of people talking to each other and, and learning from each other and growing from each other. And, um, you know, I think th that is one of the things that I think historically has allowed this country to sustain itself through history is that ability to assimilate and draw in um, stories. But I think there is this moment now where that where that is feeling feeling difficult, um, as as Shreya was saying, you know that there there are tensions and the and the tensions from the other side I think have have revealed themselves. And I think if we can continue to educate and learn and use that um, that learning to kind of approach each other in a in a kind, uh, welcoming, understanding way that we are all in the same space um, and need to find a way to coexist, I think that could be very positive. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that's exactly right, that when it comes to uh, things like empire, in fact, paradoxically, though it tends to divide and cause upset, it is common ground. It is the ground on which all of us 
in one sense or the other were constituted. And it helps us realize that at the end of the day, we constitute each other. Yes. So, you know, in reflecting on ourselves, we are reflecting on other people and reflecting on other people, we are reflecting on ourselves. On that note, um, thank you very much, Rob, Shreya, and Edson. Um, I don't think we have any questions. Uh, so um, I see Aidan's on screen. So I will uh, hand back to him uh, with a thank you. Well, it's for me to thank all four of you, Priya. Um, I think you've chaired the most fascinating discussion. Well, the reason we're doing these discussions, as I said at the beginning, is because these works today threw up um, issues. But I think what all the insights you've you have give all given us uh, have really enriched and they're thought provoking. And you know, as we at Welsh National Opera want to connect these works which can be music seen as museum pieces and we want to connect them vividly to, to today's society and and allow our audiences to make that connection so all of you have really contributed and helped us in our cause so on um, behalf of everyone double thank you so so much for such an illuminating conversation and for those of you on screen we, we have our fourth conversation on thursday same same time same procedure to look in and it's it's a topic which was just hinted at um this evening and we're it, the, the talk the discussion is called women who's telling our stories so um it's that aspect of of so much of opera where where the female characters get such a uh, a, a bad, have such a bad uh, outcome at the end. And so we have a very distinguished panel led by Jude Kelly um, to, to look at this. And again, rather like the last discussion, look at can we reinvent these narratives? So um, if you're interested, please join us for that final discussion. And once again, to, to, to Priya, to Shreya, to Edson and Robert, thank you so much for such an illuminating hour. Thank you. <laughs>